the invitation. Um, so I'm going to talk about bullet proofs today. Uh, they're short proofs for confidential transactions, but have a lot more applications than I'm also going to. And uh, this is joint work with uh, Jonathan Buhl at, from the University College London, Dan Bonet, my advisor, and also Andrew uh, Potstra, Peter, and Greg uh, from Blockstream. So, um, so let's, uh, I'm sure you've all been to, I think this is from blockchain.info. Uh, this is what, uh, if you look at a blockchain transaction, that's what it looks like there. And the important thing to notice about this transaction is that um, it has a bunch of, it has like two inputs and two outputs. And the condition that needs to be satisfied for the transaction to be valid is that the sum of the inputs is greater or equal than the sum of the outputs, right? You cannot spend more money than you've put into a transaction. It's quite natural, but this will become very important to you. Um, so what actually, uh, and then we also have the fee, which actually turns out to be the exact difference between the inputs and outputs. Um, so this is a Bitcoin transaction, and uh, what makes a Bitcoin transaction valid? So the first thing that a Bitcoin transaction needs to be valid is that there's signatures on the input. So you need to be authorized to spend the inputs. Um, so you give a correct cryptographic signatures, and then also you need to make sure that the inputs aren't uh, uh, unspent, so there's uh, unspent transaction outputs, UTXO. Uh, obviously, you can double spend money. And then this third condition that I just mentioned, the sum of the inputs is equal to the sum of the outputs plus the fee. So um, Bitcoin, let's talk about a little bit about privacy in Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is neither confidential nor anonymous. So uh, anonymity in, in cryptographic transactions means that uh, the transaction graph is hidden in some way, so that I cannot write, I cannot tell who is sending to who. So in Bitcoin, right, like one of the claims of Bitcoin is that it's that it's uh, anonymous, and it's true that you know from the address you can tell necessarily um, who there is no real name. There isn't, it doesn't say Benedict Bunz is sending uh, 1.49 Bitcoin. But still, right, there's lots of linking and, and you can easily link transactions together and there's been lots of de-anonymized papers and, and, and research on, and there are companies that actively try to de-anonymize the Bitcoin network. And it's also not confidential and confidential means that the transaction amounts are hidden. And that is what we're going to focus on today. So in, uh, uh, the basic confidentiality means that I cannot see how much is being spent. I might be able to tell who's paying whom but not how much. And if you think of like popular payment systems uh, that are not blockchain based, Venmo being the primary example, you can see who's paying whom, and you can see some funny emoji what they're paying for, but you cannot tell, uh, it doesn't say how much is being sent, right? That is hidden, uh, even if you chose, choose to make the transaction public. Um, so, uh, right, we, we can see the transactions amount, and we also see the linkage between transactions. So um, the problem about transaction amounts being in the clear, this really makes, makes Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies uh, less usable for businesses, right? Because say a company wants to pay their employees in Bitcoin, uh, then all the salaries will be public, right? You, don't, you might not want your salary to be public. Uh, it might be okay though to have it in the public, to see in the public, right? If there's a public record that I'm an employee of Stanford University, I don't care, actually my salary is probably also public, but, <laughs> uh, but I don't really care that anybody can see who my employer is, but uh, I care more about my salary being private or being confidential. And also say I have a supply chain, right? I use the blockchain for supply chain management. Ford wants to pay uh, Michelin for, for its tires. It might be okay to say, you know, everybody can figure that out, that, that uh, where Ford is buying its tires from but they don't want to say how much they're paying for a tire. That's a very important business secret. So this is why confidentiality is important even if you don't care that much about anonymity. Right? This, is a, this is an orthogonal goal. Uh, you might also very much care about uh, anonymity and these things can go together, but uh, even if you don't care about anonymity, you could very much care about uh, confidentiality. So this is why Greg proposed uh, confidential transaction, and interestingly, old eCash systems 
kind of all had some notion of privacy and, and some notion of, of confidentiality and also anonymity built in. And it was only really that the blockchain with its public verifiability that um, uh, didn't somehow naturally uh, support confidentiality because that made things a lot easier. Um, so the idea of confidential transaction is replacing these amounts with what we call a cryptographic commitment. So you can imagine a cryptographic commitment just being like I'm, 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 I'm putting a paper, I'm, putting, I'm writing down a number and putting it uh, in the middle of the room and then putting a piece of paper on it or I lock it in a box, say, right? Um, and the, the important thing is that you cannot tell, right? If the paper, if the, if the my amount that I've written down, if that is hidden, then you cannot tell how much um, so I put it in, right? I write a number on a piece of paper, put it in a box, put the box in the middle of the room. You cannot tell how, what number I've written on that paper. But if I want to open it to you later, then I can only open it to the number that I've previously uh, written down. I've committed to that number. There's no way to open the commitment to another number. And it turns out that we can do that cryptographically using, for example, something called a Patterson commitment. So this is what uh, a commitment to a number x using some randomness R looks like, it's g to the x times h to the r. And it's important that the discrete logarithm between g and h is unknown. Doesn't matter if you don't know what that means. But um, say I want to, so here, instead of uh, sending 533 units, whatever, yeah, I'm going to commit to the number 533 using some randomness. And then only if I, uh, so this perfectly hides the amount that I've committed to, but if I want to open it later, then I can only open it to the amount um, that I've previously committed to. So now we have these confidential transactions with these commitments, and, and the commitments don't reveal the amounts that are being sent, but there's an obvious problem here, right? How do I check that this transaction is valid? How do I check that the sum of the out inputs is, is, is equal to the sum of the outputs minus the fees? And it turns out that that check is actually not even sufficient. Even if we had a way to check that, that is not sufficient. And the reason is, uh, and this is a, tr a check that is so trivial that I didn't even mention it before, but you even do this in normal transactions. The reason is that I could commit to a negative number in the output. I could commit to minus 10 Bitcoin. And then, uh, so say I've, you know, right, like I've, I have inputs of two and three, that equals five and then I commit to minus 10 and plus 15, <coughs> then this equation holds true, right? The sum of e inputs is exactly equal to the sum of the outputs. But now suddenly I have this one output that is negative and this other output that is much larger than the input. So I'll just disregard the negative uh, money that I've created and uh, now create a new money out of thin air. Basically I've created inflation. Uh, and the amazing, the, the, pro the even bigger problem with that is inflation where no one can tell that this inflation was created, it's silent inflation. So that is of course, so how do, we, how do we check not only this condition, but also the condition that the outputs are positive, which in some ways this actually turns out to be the much harder check, cryptographic. And so the, uh, uh, Greg proposed this and, and right, like the, the, the nice thing about confidential transaction there, basically there, kind of compatible with Bitcoin in, in the way that the transactions look looks similar, uh, but we the, the, the core idea is that we hide the transaction <coughs> amount, but we don't hide the transaction graph. So I can still see wh what address is paying what address. And how do we get this public verifiable of transaction? Well, it's public verifiability of transaction validity. So now uh, here cryptography comes to the rescue with something called a zero knowledge proof of knowledge. So a zero knowledge proof of knowledge is in essence, or it's, it's the, the easiest way to think about it, is as an interactive protocol where you have Peggy the prover and uh, Victor the verifier. And uh, Peggy says some outrageous statement like C is equal to G to the X times H to the R and X is a positive number. And then uh, Victor wants, wants Peggy to prove this and then they can engage in basically a so-called challenge response protocol where Victor gets to ask questions and uh, Peggy gives answers to these questions 
And the interesting thing is that Peggy only can answer these questions correctly uh, if she knows if this statement is true. So if she knows an X and an R, such that X is positive and G to the X times H to the R is equal to C. And they can do this, this, this kind of multiple rounds. And at the end, the, inter this, the interesting thing is, right, that these answers do not reveal any information about what X and R are. So the only information that is revealed is that the statement is true. But other than that, Peggy's answers don't reveal any information about X and R. Um, but she could not answer these questions if the statement wasn't true, and if she didn't know X and R. So at the end, Victor will have no idea what X is, but he knows that it's positive, and that Peggy must know the value of X. Okay. So um, I want you to, to appreciate the beauty of this. Um, because this is really right, this, is, this works for, so we can do these, these proofs for, for a wide variety of statements. I can prove to you, for example, that I know the solution to Sudoku without giving you any information about what the solution is. But you will be convinced that there is a solution to Sudoku, right? There are Sudokus that are unsolvable. And, uh, but I can, if I can convince you that there is a solution to the Sudoku, you will still afterwards, the, the, the only way, you have still have no idea what the solution is, but you will be convinced that there is a solution and that I must know it. Um, and because it turns out that Sudoku is actually quite general, and if you scale this up to larger Sudokus, you can actually uh, prove for basically arbitrary, com or for, for NP statements uh, and, and, and even more complicated statements. So let's just say for arbitrary computation, uh, I can prove to you that this computation was, for example, done correctly, or that I know <coughs> secret inputs to a computation such that uh, the computation uh, evaluates to, say, 1. But uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail on that later. So this is what we call, by the way, a range proof. So the way that I prove that x is positive is that I actually prove that it is in some small range, so that it is in 0 to 2 to the 52, for example which is 2 to the 52, why, why do I chose this number? Because 2 to the 52 is enough uh, precision to represent every number from 1 Satoshi to 21 million Bitcoin. Um, by the way, it's an interesting question whether 52 bits, like whether you can actually say everybody was really using Bitcoin and, and whether 52 bits is actually quite enough, like it would be nicer if it was 64 bits, not 52. Because it might be, if, if every person in the world is using Bitcoin and uh, we really want to represent all the, the, you know, the, all the unfairness in the world and all the, the, the different wealth distributions from you know, the, the poorest uh, um, person in the world to, to uh, Bill Gates or to Satoshi Nakamoto, um, <laughs> <laughs> then uh, you might actually need more precision and it's, uh, but, well, who knows. Um, so, uh, and the interesting thing is, right, what I showed to you was, was an, an interactive proof, but uh, it turns out that we can make this into a non-interactive protocol, where Peggy just writes down a proof, you know, on a piece of paper or using a computer, and uh, sends the, the, the commitment and the proof along, and Victor can check that the proof is correct, and is then convinced that, uh, that, that C commits to a positive number. And uh, the interesting thing is that, that this is actually, so this is a publicly verified proof. So I could put the proof on the blockchain, right? And then anyone is, is convinced that, for example, the, my transaction outputs are positive. So um, how, how do I do this a little bit more concretely? So how do I prove that something is range? Well, what I do is I write down my number using, say, my 52 bits, right? If, I, if it's a number between 0 and 2 to the 52, then there's a representation using 52 bits of that number, okay? Um, and then I commit to every bit. So I send you a commitment to every single bit of that number, and I prove to you that every, um, every commitment is to either 0 or 1, so that it is a bit. And then you can check yourself uh, that basically, and I also prove to you that basically the, the base commitment is, is a commitment to the, 
to the right is really made up of these bits. And that convinces you that there's a 52-bit representation of x, which means that this number has to be somewhere between 0 and 2 to the 52. But you have no idea, because you don't learn for any bit. You, you just learn it's either 0 or 1. So it could really be any number in that range. So you learn no information of where x lies in that range. Is that, is that clear? Um, so uh, Quick question. What is it that's telling you it's positive? Oh, so, well, so the, so the problem is... Or not negative. So the problem is, okay, in these commitments, we cannot actually commit to a negative number. But what we can do is to... Commit. So you get an overflow, and then I can, like, uh, make it, like, the, the... I commit to the prime minus 10, for example. That is like a commitment to minus 10. Um, so that is what a commit... So, right? It's not really, I have to prevent commitments to really, really large numbers. And if I just keep everything like in the small range, like 52. 0 to 52 bit range, then there's no chance that we'll ever have an overflow, right? We would need like 2 to the 100 different transaction aggregated, like that won't happen. Okay. Um, uh, oh, uh, I jumped ahead here. So, um, so the best known range proofs are, are the range proofs that were previously used in confidential transactions. And uh, this is, by the way, confidential transactions were used in Monero, for example, and several uh, other private chains. Um, were based on these so-called Sigma protocols, roughly, and, and they use this fiat tremere heuristic. Um, and with a lot of optimizations uh, and really cool work um, by Blockstream, this got down to four kilobytes for a 64-bit range proof, a little bit less for a 52-bit range proof. The problem is that these proofs are linear in the number of bits that I want to do, okay? So for a 52-bit range proof, I need to send at least 52 commitments. And for a 64-bit, I need to send 64 commitments. And also, if I have multiple range proofs, I need to just send, you know, like for tw two range proofs, I just need to send twice the data. Uh, so say I have two outputs to a transaction, that just becomes, my proof just becomes twice as large, naturally, as just having one output to a transaction. So, uh, the nice thing though is that they do not require to have set up. And so, let's talk about that. The, right, what is one way, so, so this was uh, um, Peter, Andrew and Greg uh, approach us, I think over a year ago now, with kind of this problem, saying this is also for Mimblewimble, this is a problem, but. Uh, in general, you know, was, these, these proofs were kind of annoyingly large and would make, would have blown up transaction sizes. So they kind of approached us uh, with the question, hey, like, is there, can you come up with a better range proof? And uh, the one obvious co candidate, if you really care about the proof size, are uh, SNARKs. So these pre-processing SNARKs, the way that they work, just at a super, super high level, is that instead of uh, having an interactive protocol where you had to have this challenge response or these queries and there's a, a trusted party in the middle here that uh, encrypts the queries beforehand using a secret key okay so these they're encrypted in a very special way and then Peggy <coughs> can use these queries to compute a short proof so she can compute the answers and then aggregate them together and then uh, the trusted setup also produces these short, the short verification key, which are encrypted answers. So uh, using, I guess, the same key, you, you encrypt these answers and give them to, to Victor, the verifier. And then using these short answers, uh, Victor can verify these, the compressed response to the questions. Okay? And the amazing thing is that uh, these proofs are really, really slow. They, they can be like, uh, I think, like 188 bytes, or I think there's even more optimizations, right? Um, and for, 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 it doesn't matter what kind of statement I'm trying to prove to you, I can convince you in 188 bytes, and it takes 10 milliseconds to verify that the statement is correct. This is like, right, like this could be, the statement could be, uh, you know, you, you've, mathematical, complex mathematical theorem. It could be, you know, I've, I've 
scan through this whole database uh, and uh, there's no, I've scanned through this police database and there's no entry under your name or whatever. Um, something like that, it could all be done and the proof for that would be 188 bytes and the verification is, slow, uh, is short, is, is, is 10 milliseconds. So uh, the problem with this trusted setup is that if the trusted setup is malicious, then, so it cooperates with the, the prover, of it, then uh, you can create fake proofs. So I can create proofs for statements that aren't true, right? I can tell you that this number is within 0 and 52 bits, well, it actually is the super large number, or this, this negative number, right? Um, so because once I have the decryption key for these queries, I can very easily fake, num fake answers to them, okay? So this is, and what is also problematic, so this is um, uh, very problematic uh, because, not only because you can create fake proofs, but because, right, like, the, subverting this proof could lead to undetectable inflation. And I talked about this a little bit earlier. It could lead to someone creating money out of thin air. And the problem is because, so for example, in Zcash, Zcash uses Snart. If the Zcash trusted setup was broken, then someone, and I'm in no way suggesting that, uh, then someone could create new Zcash tokens out of thin air. And what is even worse is there would be no way of telling. You wouldn't know, right? We would not have no idea that would just suddenly someone would have more, more, more Zcash, could sell them for, for money, and, and you can also claim that the trusted setup is broken and, and do some fear mongering and to dump the price of Zcash, uh, and there wouldn't even be a way of, of disputing that, right? Like there's no, uh, this is not falsifiable. Uh, so even the fear of undetectable inflation is dangerous for a cryptocurrency. So. Uh, what you can do is you can replace the trusted set of this one guy with a group of people, which is exactly what Zcash has done. And then it, as long as at least one person is, is honest, uh, the trusted setup will be okay. But this is very expensive and difficult. The, the other problem is that for any kind of type of statements that you want to prove, you need to create a new trusted setup. So again, you need to run through these, this expensive computation. So this is very annoying and, and uh, was, uh, overall, this was not acceptable for us. So for example, there's this, this, this paper called Hawk where you have these privacy preserving smart contracts and the functionality looks amazing. The problem is it's, it's, it's completely uh, unusable uh, because you would need a trusted setup per smart contract. It just doesn't really work. There's also this work on, uh, on, on, on Starks or the, their CS proofs, computationally sound proofs. Um, it's been theory has, the theory has been around for forever, since 2001, but now finally, actually, we have, we have, uh, we're getting towards, or there are implementations there. Uh, so these, these Starks is, is the first real world kind of implementation of these CS proofs. However, the, the, uh, um, the main problem, one of the main problems that makes them completely unusable, they don't have a trusted setup, but one of the main problems that makes them unusable is, is that the proof size is, is at least 200 kilobytes. Um, so that's just not, right? Like we've got, this is even worse than what we've previously had. Um, and the prover, creating proof is, is extremely uh, computationally expensive. So there's this beautiful work, beautiful theory, but unfortunately not quite practical, especially not for this application of range proofs. So then we found this paper, or we've, 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 we've looked at this paper by Boodle et al, who, uh, Jonathan Boodle is also one of the co-authors of Bulletproofs, and they had these so-called log size proof for arithmetic circuits. And uh, what this was is it's an interactive proof, so there was a, the prover and verifier talked to each other, and but the verifier's messages were just random, and there's a basically a standard way. If the verifier, all he says is like random numbers, then there's a standard way of making this interactive protocol into a non-interactive protocol. But the cool thing is that these, this proof produced uh, very, very, this, this proof protocol produced very, very short proofs. So they were logarithmic, 6 log n to be precise, uh, 6 log n 32 byte elements. Um, and only relied, it only relied on the dispute logarithm and such, and it didn't have a trusted setup. 
and the uh, um, you could do proofs for arbitrary arithmetic circuits. So what does that mean? An arithmetic circuit is is kind of a right like you you can imagine like an electronic circuit where you have input wires and, and some outputs and and at every you take always take two inputs wires and then you do either an addition or a multiplication okay and you can kind of any program any C program you can compile to an arithmetic circuit and then the question is do you know or like any C function I guess uh, and then you the, the question is do you know inputs to that program? So do you know inputs to that circuit such that the circuit evaluates to, like the outputs are, are fixed, uh, such that the inputs evaluate to the outputs? So for example, I can implement a hash function as a circuit, and then I say, do you know inputs to the hash function, so inputs to the circuit, such that the output of the circuit is um, zero or some Three, four, five, six, whatever. Some, some, some output of a hash function. Proof. So I can give you one of these bool, these, these proofs from uh, that is only logarithmic in the size of the circuit. So no matter how complex I, I can double the size of my my uh, circuit, but I only need to add a few. Uh, this only adds constant elements, number of elements to the size of the proof. Um, However, so we, we thought, okay, this is an interesting step. However, this didn't really work for, for uh, range proofs. And the reason is that the range proof is, this is, is fairly technical, but the range proof is, is this commitment, right? And the problem is that really I want to just do operations on the commitment in the proof. So I want to define the circuit such that it takes in kind of the secret value x that I've committed to, and says, okay, I can decompose this into bits, and uh, here is, uh, like I can decompose this into bits, and, and all the bits are either ones or zeros. The problem is that uh, these, these, these proofs, while they're very general, in practice, you uh, cannot make proofs, or it was hard to make proofs on committed value. You would have to implement the commitment function, so, um, an exponentiation in the circuit which will blow the whole thing up and at the end it would be uh, basically worse than it wouldn't be even better like in terms of proof size than the, than the pre protocol we had before. But it was an interesting start uh, because it got us sublinear proofs, logarithmic size proofs. So uh, we took that and, and based on that built bullet proofs which allows us to exactly do these proofs on committed values. So I can commit to number x, and then just build my circuit where x is one of the, the inputs to that circuit. Um, and then uh, we also got the proof size a lot down from, so from 6 log n to, to 2 log n. Um, uh, and that means, right, what that means is that uh, if I have a range proof for 64 bits, and I want one for uh, 128 bits, so I double the size of my range, I'm only going to add two elements to the proof, so 64 bytes. So at doubling the range adds 64 bytes, no matter what range you're at. Um, and it, again, it, it relies on the same assumption, and we designed this specifically for range boost, but we also kept the general version, or, or improved the general version, and we are also able to make proofs for these arbitrary arithmetic circuits. So very general proof system. So, and basically snarks also are proofs on arithmetic circuits, so whatever you can do a snark for, you can do a bulletproof. However, um, and you don't need a trusted setup anymore. However, the downside is, or what is the, the downside compared to snarks, is that the verification time is linear in the statement. So linear in the size of the circuit. So if my circuit has like four million gates, then I will, um, then my verification will be linear in four million, whereas for snarks, they're constant. But on the other side, snarks have the trusted setup. So now we have this trade-off. And now, um, so let's look at the proof sizes a little bit more, more concretely. And, and also what happens is, uh, one, one very important thing is, 
say I want to prove that two outputs are in a range, uh, right? So I have my two transaction outputs. I have a transaction with two outputs. And I want to prove that both of them in a, are in a range. Because of the log scaling, this is only 64 bytes more expensive than doing one range proof. So we'll see this here. So we are already, for a single range proof, uh, bulletproofs is a lot better than, uh, than uh, the old CT range proofs. So 670 bytes versus 4 kilobytes. However, if you have two proofs, then the old range proof grew linearly, the new range proof grows by 64 bytes. And then say you have 10 proofs, then right, like, so the top line is the old range proof, the red line is bulletproofs, uh, you grow by, you know, it, it hardly grows, it's 928 bytes. You'll be hard pressed to, to uh, ever get this over a kilobyte. Um, or, uh, so the more transactions, the more outputs your transaction now has, the smaller the, basically, the relative size or the bigger the improvement gets for your proof, uh, for, for bulletproofs versus uh, the old range was. And SNARKs are obviously, they, they, their constant size, 188 bytes, uh, but they have their trusted setup. So, how do we create this, kind of led to this question of why, you know, like, you know, people might want to pay all their, you might want to, like, you know, send some Bitcoin to all your relatives for Christmas, if you're nice, uh, but, but, like, what, what, how can we incentivize people to create transactions with many outputs. Now that this is like, this is relatively cheaper than having one trans, having multiple transactions with a single output. So there's this protocol called coin join, where, where multiple people can join their transaction together. So the question is like, how can we have a coin join of these three peggies that don't really like, or they don't fully trust each other, but they want to uh, create um, one single proof that all of their commitments, so all of their outputs are within, within a range without having to reveal the secrets to each other, right? They don't want to send each other these, the, the transaction amounts, they just want to do a coin join protocol to, to, to join their transactions together. And it turns out that, so we designed this, this very uh, simple, right? They could just concatenate their proof, but that would grow linearly. So we designed this, this simple, it's called an MPC, a multi-party computation. So we designed this very specific, secure, multi-party computation that allows them in, in just a logarithmic number of rounds and logarithmic communication or a constant number of rounds and, and you know, a little bit more communication, you know, trade-offs here, uh, to create this join proof together. So we basically allow them to, to coin join. We, we have this custom protocol that allows bullet proofs and coin join to work nicely together and that will help creating transactions with more outputs um, that are now, with now the proof size relative to the number of outputs gets very, very low. Um, so what is the, the, let's summarize the result of, of bulletproofs, how bulletproofs can help confidential transactions, and all of this basic carries over, over to Mimbo Wimbo. Um, so 670 bytes instead of 4 kilobytes per range proof for a 64 bit range. But the important thing is the aggregation, right? You, you double your range, you add 64 bytes. Um, and this, this, and UW precision also had 64 bytes. Uh, so really, right, like the more output that you have, the more impressive this gets. And the, and the overall result is, if you don't assume that the transactions change, so you don't have more outputs per transaction, which, you know, you would assume that this will happen, kind of through incentives and whatever, uh, but even if you just apply this to the UTXO set, with confidential transaction previously, the UTXO set would have been 160 gigabytes, which is hard to keep in memory. Um, but now, this, applying this uh, would add, would make the UTXO set only 17 gigabytes. So a lot more practical uh, than what we previously had. And this built-in uh, simple coin join protocol for combining confidential transactions. We were hoping to get something that is quantum sound. Uh, that we don't have that. So a quantum computer cannot break the anonymity of the scheme, but he can do something even worse. He can uh, basically you know, create fake proofs, which would, again, create silent inflation. And uh, like Zcash has the same problem, and Monero as well, I guess. Uh, but uh, that is unfortunately something we were 
not able to achieve, and, and, and at least using the techniques that we have now, there's, there's fundamental reasons why you can't do that, uh, why you can't achieve unconditional soundness. <coughs> and so I also said, right, like, that bulletproofs work for these arbitrary arithmetic circuits, so for kind of, you know, something where you would normally apply a snark to. So what does the, the proof size kind of look like? Um, so this is a log-log scale, so this is the number of, of, of kind of gates, roughly the size of the computation. And you see that, uh, you know, snarks are, again, uh, wonderful um, in terms of their proof size, they have the trusted setup. And Starks, these are kind of estimates from the paper. It's, um, but uh, either way, they're 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 just for you know they start at 200 kilobytes and and uh, also grow logarithmically, but but uh, grow worse than than uh, the bulletproofs. And uh, right, bulletproofs are a lot lot shorter than than Starks in the current construction can ever be. Um, so Starks are, yeah. Um, and so the, wh why did I put these numbers? So 4 million gates is roughly what uh, a current, what a Zcash transaction, the, the circuit for a Zcash transaction. Basically in Zcash, I prove that I know some secret inputs such that the super complicated statement holds. And the statement so is, is so I, I, know, I know basically a coin that has not been spent and you know, the, I also have to do a range proof in there. But basically doing that uh, th takes uh, 4 million gates and the bulletproof proof size would be 1.8 kilobytes, whereas the star proof size would be 455 kilobytes, so completely unusable, and, and, and ZK, uh, the snarks are only 188 bytes. There are lots of improvements to the Zcash uh, recently, and, and they will use a much more efficient circuit, kind of a smaller circuit, that however does the same thing. And there the proof size would only be 1.3 kilobytes, which somehow gets into the realm of maybe practicality, but um, the, there's other reasons why we cannot do this um, with bulletproofs yet. Um, the main reason is that, that verification, verifying a transaction would take too long. So for Zcash, you still definitely need some. So I, uh, let's look at an overview um, <coughs> of the, uh, actually, are there any questions maybe at this point about confidential transactions, about overviews? We can also, like, we can have a more in-depth question round, so like really, yeah, Corn, like if stuff that you haven't understood correctly, right, right, yeah. Uh, I, I have a really stupid question potentially. Um, do you, do you need to keep no, definitely stupid? Um, do you need to keep track of the X you committed to, or you can you can is it either encrypted as part of the transaction, or can you derive it afterwards if you only have the private key? Um, so the way I've described, you would have to keep track of both the the the. Um, you would have to keep track of the X you committed to and also the randomness that you use. But you can, I mean, you can think of that as, as kind of your private key now. So just um, because it gets bundled up in the private key for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's other ways you could use, not partisan commitments, you could use a different commitment scheme where you would only have to keep track of a private key. Um, and, but in general, you have to know, uh, yes, you have to keep track of how much money you have. Okay. Um, let me let me go on and uh, do so now. Let's let's have talked about all these different crazy proof systems. Let's do some and, and it seems now right that we have different proof systems with different trade-offs. There's no uh, magic bullet basically uh, that will uh, works for everything, but bulletproofs adds a different set of trade-offs to our uh, scheme. So Sigma protocol is, is a very classical is a very classical simple proof system that you will basically see in, in, in uh, a crypto book, and by crypto I mean cryptography. And the proof sizes, however, are long, uh, but they don't have a trusted setup, and this is better than um, the bulletproofs just clearly improves on them. Bulletproofs just has shorter proof sizes. The verification, they're both asymptotically linear, but it turns out actually that the bulletproofs 
verification is extremely fast, and I'll talk about that uh, practically very good, so I'll talk about that in a second. The snarks, they uh, knock the ball, knock, knock the ball, ball out of the park in terms of, of verifier efficiency or efficiency for uh, the verifier and in terms of proof size. However, they have the trusted setup. The prover is actually quite expensive, a lot more expensive than than uh, bulletproofs and has a big memory requirement. You need to have a machine. The assumptions that uh, Snarks use are a lot less tested and, and a lot, we say they have stronger assumption, which is worse. You want weak assumptions, right? You want to assume, if your proof system is built on assuming that the earth is round and that's a decent assumption, it's not perfectly round. If your proof system is built on the fact that the earth is flat, then, you know, it's probably not very secure. That's a strong assumption. It's just also wrong, but the, the um, yeah, that, that will mean that your proof is uh, more fake. So, snarks have stronger assumptions than bulletproofs, um, but, and have the trusted setup, but are, in general, more efficient. Um, Starks, on the other hand, don't have the trusted setup. They are uh, have an asymptotically efficient verifier. The proof size is short in terms of asymptotics, but large in practice, right? It doesn't grow much the, the bigger the statement that you prove, but it starts at 200 kilobytes, which may be, for, for example, for the, for the confidential transactions, that was an absolute no-go. Um, and the prover is extremely, uh, like, almost prohibitively expensive. So it really, like, for very complex things where the seeming benefit jumps in, the prover gets so, so expensive that uh, this might help. So Stark's a beautiful theoretical result. I would say that, uh, you know, they're unfortunately not quite yet practical. But there's, there's uh, amazing research going into that area, of course. Um, so, what are some other applications for bulletproofs, right? I said, you know, you can do range proofs, but you can uh, you do, do other stuff with it. And what are some other uh, interesting cryptocurrency, non-cryptocurrency applications? So we wrote this paper in 2015, uh, when this was shortly after the Mt. Gox hacks, hack, where the big question was always doing the Mt. Gox hack and, and doing the, you know, there was some time where there was a divergence in the price between Mt. Gox and, and the other exchanges, and, and people who've lost money will, will very fondly remember this time. Um, and the big question was whether Mt. Gox was solvent, and they were not. But uh, we developed this protocol, right, and, and, and basically Greg also had, had some preliminary protocol, had some protocol on, on how to... Um, all my research is basically just taking Greg's idea and trying to slide <laughs> it. But, uh, so the, 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 uh, Greg had this protocol and how exchanges could prove that they're solvent. However, they would have to reveal how much money they've kept in total. And, and then exchanges said, oh no, that's a no-go for us. We don't want to do that. So we showed that using also zero-knowledge proofs, how an exchange can prove that they're solvent without revealing any information. So they don't have to say uh, how much money they have in total, how much each customer has. They don't even have to say which Bitcoin addresses they control. All of that stays private, but they can still convince you that they have enough money, uh, they have as much money as uh, the customers have deposited. And so uh, these proofs got very large in the, in the way that we originally proposed them using these Sigma protocols. There were 18 gigabytes with bulletproofs, you could get that down to 62 megabytes. Um, so, unfortunately, no exchange has implemented this. <laughs> Still hoping that one day, I feel like it takes one exchange to implement this, and maybe some pressure from the public, and then the others will have to follow suit. But, but. Um, the other thing is that, that bulletproofs uh, could also be used for, for smart contracts. Any, you know, an Ethereum-like on smart contract, but also uh, Bitcoin has smart contract-like uh, features. Um, and because there, you can have short proofs for arbitrary computation, and right in the blockchain setting, why do, we, why do I care so much about these short proofs in general? It's more a high-level point. Um, because, right, in a blockchain, everything, everybody needs to read everything, at the very least, right? 
I need to send everything around, and, and, and it's a it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, so every message that is gets sent needs to be read by everyone. Uh, the problem is that that you know network speed is a lot more prohibitive than uh, than computation. Right? I, usually, the bottleneck in many many applications is is uh, bandwidth, not computation. Right? Um, so. We really care, right? Like while computation may be cheap, we really care a lot about the proof size, right? Transaction sizes are a lot more important than the time it takes to verify a transaction. Also important, but not as important, right? Um, because you really mostly care about the bottleneck, which seems to be the transaction size. Um, so for smart contracts, right? You might be able to, so right? They like snarks. Both proofs work for arbitrary uh, computation. So, and they don't have a trusted setup. So you can do a new smart contract without requiring a new trusted setup. So that works a lot better than a snark. Um, but the problem is that verification is linear. So uh, what can we do about that, right? Like a smart contract is also computationally, that is actually, right, a smart contract is actually computation limited. And you could have a smart contract that verifies it bulletproof, but that is, you know, is, is fairly expensive. So thankfully, there's this, this so-called referee delegation model. And if you heard of Truebit, that is basically what Truebit does. Um, so Truebit, the, the idea is that you send the proof to the smart contract, right? Say uh, you send the proof for, send a range proof, or you send a proof that uh, you know some hash parameter or some other computation. You send that to the smart contract, and the smart contract just stores the proof, it doesn't verify it. And then, um, and you also send, and you lay down, you lay out the basically the verification computation, right? The verification computation is, is some sort of computation that you can, you know, you can each processor, each, uh, you can lay that out into steps, right? It might have, uh, you know, a thousand steps or a million steps or whatever, but you can lay that out into steps. And uh, you send, basically a, a Merkle tree commitment to all of these steps to the smart contract and the middle, the middle point. And then uh, someone else can read the proof and check, oh wait, you know, I've, I created a cheating proof and then someone else sees it and says, hey wait, Benedict, this, this proof is wrong, uh, we need to do something about it. Um, and then they can complain to the smart contract and then the smart contract could either run the verification but we can do something smarter. We can basically find that if the if we disagree on whether the proof is right, there will be one point in the verification computation where we diverge. It might be right at the beginning. It might be somewhere in the middle, right? So what we can do is we can run a, 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 a binary search. So I claim my proof is right. You say it is wrong, I've run the verification, and at point, like in the middle, the value should be this. And I say, okay, I agree that it's in, uh, like basically I could disagree with that point. I'm saying, no, it's this, uh, let's find the point, okay, then we know that we must disagree somewhere in the first half of the transcript, right? If we disagree on what the value at VN2 is, then we must disagree the first point where we dis disagree must be at some point in here. And then we find, like maybe after, after a couple more binary search steps, we find that from like V64 to V65, like we agree on V64, but we disagree on V65. And between V64 and V65, there's like, say, that it's just one multiplication, one very simple operation. And then the smart contract can just take V64 apply that simple operation, say in addition, to V64, and then uh, the, the uh, and then the uh, smart contract will can verify and check who of the two of us, if I the prover or the challenger was correct. And you can combine this with incentives, with bounties once, whatsoever, that is exactly what Truebit is doing. Uh, but basically you can use this interactive verification to uh, not have the smart contract do the work, but everybody can still do the work. So th the important thing is that, that right, like the proof only gets checked when it's wrong, hopefully, and even then, 
the smart contract only has to do a logarithmic number of work and not a linear work. And the, all the work is done off chain. So um, this is a, kind of a nice marriage because right, the only thing I can just post the proof on the chain because it's small. I don't need to send something. If I had a long proof, then even posting that to the chain would be very expensive. Um, yeah, so it's log, log t runs and log t communication. There's also this, uh, I'll, I might actually skip over this, but the, the, there's another um, uh, thing that you can do, say you have a bunch of messages, there's this so-called thing called a mixnet. So if I, this was originally designed, it's not just a cryptocurrency uh, application, but uh, if I had, say, uh, a bunch of emails, right? We all have some emails and we want to hide who's sending to whom or we have some encrypted emails, then we can use what is called a mixnet to basically shuffle them up in a way that no one will be able to tell which input, which mail from whom goes to which recipient. Uh, so you get anonymity for this. One important thing is that this requires uh, this zero knowledge proof that basically two lists commit to the same values. So I have a, one list committing to you know, n values, and then I have another list that also commits to n values, and I want to prove that one is basically a shuffle of the other. And it turns out that the best protocol we previously known was, was square root in the size of the list, and with bulletproofs we can do that uh, in logs, log, logarithmic size without a trusted set. So now uh, let's talk about something more practical, mainly the implementation of, of this thing. <coughs> I haven't really talked about you know what what is the I've already said verification is expensive, but you know there's an interesting question: is it actually that expensive, or what what is the what is the cost of verifying the bulletproof? And um, the beautiful thing is that that Andrew and Peter have done amazing work on on, on implementing this into Lipsec. P, um, and so the, the cryptographic library that Bitcoin uses, um, and, and uh, it's most parts already implemented, and, and uh, we're doing more work on, on, on improving this. Um, and I've also heard that there's multiple other implementations planned. So, what is the so it turns out that this implementation is extremely fast, and I want to go into some details why it can be so fast. So basically what, what uh, Andrew and Peter did is, is take this extremely complicated protocol, which uh, <coughs> you don't have to read, but uh, it turns out that, that verifying a bulletproof, in the end, all it really boils down to is this one large multi-exponentiation. For, for a size circuit of size n, the multi-exponentiation is of size 2n. So I take, I have my different generators, G1 to G2n, and I raise it to some exponents. And this is really the majority of the work. Just check whether that is equal to zero. That is basically the main check that I need to do when I'm a verifier. There's some other stuff, but this is the, 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 the expensive part of it. Um, so it turns out that there is um, really, this is a very well studied problem of how to do this, this multi exponentiation fast. And it turns out that it actually scaled sublinear. So um, if you look at, well, okay. So this is for a range proof. Uh, and, and if you just look at the, the, the number of bits of the range proof, you can't really tell the sublinear part, but the, 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 the important takeaway message is that. Uh, a 64-bit range proof takes 4 milliseconds, and I think we've even gotten that down to, I think the nearest numbers are 2.5 milliseconds, but, you know, they, they change by the minutes, but let's say it's less than 4 milliseconds, or on the order, uh, not more than, not much more than 4 milliseconds, that's what I'm going to claim, which is even faster than verifying a snark, right? I've, I've said this whole time that verifying snarks is so, so fast. Uh, the beauty is that for, for the specific applications of range proofs, bulletproofs is actually even better. And uh, verifying a stock is, is much, much more expensive. Of course, this is a little bit, um, you know, this is a 
bit of a misrepresentation because if I want to prove a lot more complicated statements, the kind of the linear part of bulletproofs will grow until it surpasses uh, snarks and at some, at some point also starks, which do not grow linearly. Starks grow logarithmically and, and snarks do not grow at all. So, um, however, okay, so this is nice. We can verify. In the, uh, yeah, that slide, it says proof time in MUS. And microseconds. Microseconds. Yes. So it's four milliseconds because it's 4,000 4, microseconds. A thousand microseconds is one millisecond. So, you know, in, in real time, this is all very fast. Uh, but, you know, these, these numbers, I mean, Peter knows a lot more about this, but, uh, you know, it, it matters whether it's four, four milliseconds is, 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 is doable, like 400 milliseconds, which to me still seems fast, is absolutely not doable for a miner who needs to mi verify, or, it's, you know, I don't know, maybe it's doable, but it's, it's a lot harder for, for a miner who needs to verify a whole block with a bunch of new transactions in a very fast time, right? The, the problem is that if I'm a miner and I receive a block with a bunch of transactions, I have to be very quickly be able to convince myself whether those transactions are valid or not. And also, of course, if I re-download the chain, right? This, uh, I have to very, very quickly verify that all the transactions are correct. But, but especially for a miner or full node, uh, it's very important to quickly verify that I'm, I'm, uh, I've received the valid block because if I don't, or uh, then I, or I'm not fast enough, then basically as a small miner, I, uh, there's the basic economies of scale come into place. People with bigger machines and people with, actually also people with more hash power will have an advantage because you don't need to verify your own block. So in order to cre keep uh, the decentralization high, it is extremely important that, that verification is fast, otherwise you also run into this problem called the verifier's dilemma, where it is actually not rational for a verifier to ver verify a block, and then at some point no one will verify a block, and then you can create false block. Ethereum, this is a much bigger problem for Ethereum, but in general, uh, it is like verification should almost be free, otherwise uh, there, there are economic problems coming up. So this is why uh, we really care about this. So, but you know, let's look at this case where I have actually two transactions that I want to verify, right? So I said verifying a transaction comes down to this big multi-exponentiation. So I have my, uh, the, this is the, the first transaction up there is with the X's and the second transaction has Y's as exponents, but the generators happen to stay the same, okay? So I want to check that, you know, the first line equation holds and the second equation holds. And I can obviously just do them, you know, after one after another or in parallel or whatever. But basically, my, if I just do this naively, this cost will grow up with the number of transactions that I verify. However, Andrew came up with this, with this, with this great trick of, or this, it's, it's also, uh, like this is a, an, an old trick that has been known, but, but Andrew realized that we can also apply this which is called batch verification. And this was originally invented by Belair and, and Tal Rabin. Um, and the idea is that you draw a random, as if I want to verify these two equations, maybe I can combine them into one equation. So I draw a random alpha, so just some large, out of some large space, you know, uh, some 40-bit alpha, and uh, multiply the first, or raise the first equation to the power of alpha, and then multiply it together with the second equation. So what do I get? I get g1 to the alpha times x1 plus y1, and so on and so forth. And clearly, if the first equation holds, this will also hold. However, it turns out that if my alpha is, is, is random enough, then it is very, very unlikely that the second equation will hold, but the first two won't. So verifying the second equation is as good as verifying the first two equations. Okay? Uh, does that make sense? Right? Uh, I basically randomized the, the equation, the first equation, put them together, and and if you look at the math or if if you try a different alpha, there's, there's uh, you have to get really really unlucky with your alpha 
for uh, this, the second equation to verify, but the first two to not verify. So, uh, why is this so good? Why is this so important? The expensive operation is the exponentiation, not the scalar operations. The scalar operations are relatively extremely cheap. So basically now, no matter, right, because I can combine two transactions and I can actually combine all of my transactions in a block, I still only have to do one multi-exponentiation and the size of the multi-exponentiation doesn't grow. It's still, you know, say I have a 64-bit range proof, it's still going to be, I guess, 2n, so 128. I only need to do a couple more scalar operations. Um, so suddenly, my, my, my uh, verifying the second transaction is a lot cheaper than verifying the first transaction. So I guess these are the updated numbers. Or I, again, don't fully like quote me on this, uh, but you know, order of magnitude, verifying the second transaction is going to get ten times is is, is uh, like roughly ten times faster than verifying the first transaction. So it's uh, say two or three hundred fifty microseconds. Um, and it actually turns out, so, so what does 350 microseconds, you know, it sounds short, but what does that mean? Uh, and right, like, the, basically if I, if I verify, you know, a thousand transactions or 10,000 transactions, the, the, the 2.5 milliseconds will get amortized. So, you know, the verifying transaction now really becomes only 350 microseconds. So what does that mean? Well, let's compare it to Bitcoin currently. In Bitcoin currently, you need to verify an ECDSA signature. Verifying an ECDSA signature is roughly 70 microseconds in the same code, also using uh, Peter's amazing library. Um, so now, verifying a confidential transaction is only five times slower than verifying, uh, um, verifying uh, uh, um, an ECDSA signature. So everybody just needs to buy five times as many processors or, you know, it, it's not that much, right? Like it, it's five times is, is really, you know, this is, now really gets us into the realm of feasibility. And the proof sizes, I think, they're three times bigger than, like it would make the transactions roughly three times bigger than, than currently, right? So, you know, your transaction size blows up by a factor of three, your, your verification time blows up by a factor of five, but this is not undoable anymore. Right? This now really gets us into the realm of things that, uh, and you know, there might be more optimizations, but this really gets us into the realm of things that you can think about at least, you know, having, uh, adding uh, to your favorite blockchain. Yeah. Um, so, would the range just be aggregated per transaction or for the whole block? Uh, so this would be, you would do this per, per, for the whole block. Basically, you would still, this, this different kind of aggregation per transaction which saves space, you basically say, okay, I'm going to support, you know, 10 UTXOs per transaction, so 16 UTXOs per transaction, and then uh, you would uh, do basically the aggregation is, is when you're verifying, say, the whole blockchain or a whole block at once. Okay. So, because these are the, 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 this, these are the times that are really time critical, where you, where you care about it being fast. So when, Yes, once, once per block. It's, you really care about that scenario. It's not that important to verify transactions when they're coming in slowly, because you have 10 minutes to you know, check each one by, one by one. It's really the case, I'm getting a block, and I want to know almost instantaneously, is that block correct? Or, or, or during a, a catch-up synchronization, potentially okay. across multiple blocks. Yeah, it could, because uh, you would do this, you can do this over all, all transactions ever if you, uh, yeah, if you're frisky. Um, OK. So, um, are there any questions? So I, I could go into the very, very <coughs> deep technical details of this. I honestly don't think it really makes sense, but um, if you want to, and if there are no more questions, then I, I can do that. But I think maybe let's ask some, let's answer some questions. There's one question back here. Uh, I was just gonna add to the previous thing um, that you're only really, So yeah. It's not even necessarily the entire size of the block. Yeah, and by the way, one, one thing that is, uh, so that's a very good point. Um, what is also important is that, um, say you 
are right. You don't just have range proofs. So you somehow you add more complicated bullet proofs. This aggregation, so say, is more maybe the case for smart contracts. Say you want to verify ten different proofs for kind of ten different statements. Uh, you can still aggregate them. It doesn't matter kind of what your statements are. Only the size of the statements. You, they still this this aggregation trick still very much works. And um, yeah. So maybe I'm missing something kind of fundamental. If I'm submitting the bulletproof as my transaction, how does the recipient of my payment know how much they've received or that I sent? Uh, so it? that's a very good question. So basically the question is, yeah, for confidential transactions, if I receive a confidential transaction, how do I uh, use that or how do I know how much I receive? So basically what you do is either you communicate the opening to the commitment off-chain or you can encrypt it. Uh, using public key encryption, you basically encrypt it under the uh, receiver's address. Um, but I don't. I think what you use in practice. You yeah, know, no, we have an encryption. A actually, we have something more bizarre, but <laughs> it's equivalent to an encryption. So, if I'm the receiver of the payment, I'm gonna have to keep track of that as an extra wallet component. Uh, yes. I mean, you know, there's uh, uh, there's other tricks, right? Like I can. Uh, what I can do is uh, I can tell you what randomness you should use for my commitment, and I can generate that randomness from you know, some small seed, and then I have to keep the seed around. There's uh, different, and then I could actually re recover the, the balance if I want to. They, you know, there's different tricks you can use to make this practical. From, from in the Elements project, we integrated confidential transactions into the Bitcoin code base, and the wallet changes required to make it work are almost trivial. So. It's just the recipient learns of the values from encrypted data in the transaction and just handles it. Okay. So the, yeah, I don't know, this, do people hear you online when they watch this online? Greg was saying that uh, yeah. this is uh, trivial changes. <laughs> 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 to the wallet structure. <laughs> just wave at it. Uh, I have another question about the engineering implications. So. So if you submit an aggregated range proof with a, like, a Bitcoin transaction or a mid-level transaction, how does that affect the ability to like, prune or cut through uh, like outputs later? Um, so um, you need to keep the bulletproof around. No, you don't. No? You don't? <laughs> OK. Uh, I pass yeah. Give me a microphone. Here, let me take this. <laughs> yeah. So it depends if you're talking about like a Bitcoin like style or Mimble Wimble like style. In the Mimble Wimble like style, you keep the range proofs around. Yes. And do it in that case. In um, a, a Bitcoin like style, like we have in Elements, the range proofs are witness data like transaction signatures. So after you verified them, you would you would forget them on a prune node. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just a different different trade off <laughs> in those models. What about Mimble Wimble? Do you have, you have to keep the full range proof for outputs that have been spent? Like it <laughs> yeah, it would limit some of the pruning in Mimblewimble if you were aggregating there. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to disagree with what you just said. Okay. Um, <laughs> because you're talking about two different validation models. Uh, in a model where I want to keep the data to prove you trust to you trustlessly that the entire history of the chain was valid. Yeah. In Bitcoin, I would need to keep keep the range proofs around just as in Mimblewimble. Yep. And in, uh, if I only want to convey to you uh, enough information to validate future changes, you actually need to keep the range probes around them. Right, you right. still, but you don't need them in Bitcoin then. Yeah. So. Fair enough, but the aggregation doesn't have an implication there. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Thank Any more questions? Yes. So, what's the future for? Uh, Bulletproofs? Uh, yeah, so. So uh, the question is what are the, the, the plans for bulletproofs? Um, so I think that Monero is planning on implementing this. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that is what I've, what I've heard, and, and uh, that will be somewhat exciting and slightly scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is new, uh, you know, this, this has been. Uh, we've submitted it to an academic conference and it got accepted and it's peer reviewed, right? This is not uh, just some idea that we came up with and we have a, we have a security proof. However, you know, the, in general, the deployment of cryptography 
the speed of deployment of cryptography that is seen in this space is, is incredible and, and has never been seen before and has never been tested before and um, you know that it will be like it would be extremely exciting but uh, yeah it's, it's also not you know this is not as as well tested as an ECDSA signature or, or a Schnorr signature uh, where we you know this has been around for for I don't know 20 years 30 years uh, yeah. Well, you'll be somewhat confident after a month after it's been deployed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, when, when it's, uh, yeah. That is true. So. Actually, no, that is not true. <laughs> that is unfortunately <laughs> not completely true because unless that person tells you how it's broken, uh, you, it will just create silent inflation and will be bad. Can I make a comment on that? Yes. <laughs> So actually, Monero gives a great example for this because Monero was, was unsound for the first couple of years of its existence where you could, at least theoretically, create coins out of nothing due to implementation flaws in the ring signature stuff. So one of the interesting challenges with this whole area is even if the math is all solid yeah. as an implementer, we don't necessarily know the gotchas on what we might implement uh, incorrectly, like often the often the sort of math at the paper level doesn't tell you all the little corner cases that you have to catch for all the special subconditions. Yeah. And so when you implement a digital signature validator, lots of people have done that, and the, the foot guns are well known. But implementing zero knowledge proofs, uh, the foot guns aren't as well known. And in fact, a lot of these systems have a property that if you if you get things wrong, they still work in the honest case. <laughs> so yeah. you can't always tell when they're broken. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is a very good point, right? And, and you know, the, the security proof that says that the paper is form that the that this protocol formally works and formally secures, but uh, you know, there's so many gotchas, and so yeah, exactly Greg's point. Uh, and implementing this is, you know, do not try this at home. I would say, right? <laughs> <laughs> like uh, trust, you know, use for example Lipsec, uh, which which is uh, not, yet. <laughs> not, not yet, but you know. When, when we say it's ready, because um, this is a much more tested code. And, and uh, But at the very least, you know, one thing that, that should provide some confidence is that the math that is used, so the underlying fundamental assumptions, are extremely well tested. So it just relies on the discrete logarithm assumption. The paper looks extremely complicated, but it is just, uh, you know, exponentiations and additions. And there's no, you know, that, that stuff at least it's well tested. And, yeah. So, yeah, sorry. I'm stuck on this earlier idea of the, the amounts. I can submit a transaction to the network with bulletproof, and then I can sign a message or an encrypted message that tells you I just sent you a million. But mm -hmm. I can tell anybody I sent them a million. Well, I think the idea is that you can then verify that the commitment is correct. So, so you're, you're receiving. Can, well, what you're receiving is basically an opening to the commitment, and then you can directly check whether that is correct. correct. How do I check? You just, uh, you just do recommit. Re so um, it's right. The commitment looks like this, and I tell you, uh, I send you ten, and I use randomness R three. That's some large random number, and then you can just check whether G to the ten times H to the R three. And by the binding property, right? This is exactly the the so called binding property of the commitment. I cannot give you another combination of, of X and R that will convince you or that will open to this. Otherwise, I've broken the commitment scheme. Okay, thanks for that. Um, you compared the verifier being uh, before we talked about the big uh, multi-exponentiation uh, trick that you can apply to bulletproof. Yeah. If we apply that, does the verifier be yeah. comparable to start? So, so, well, that really depends. So in the case of range proofs, it already beats snarks. So for a range proof, like use bulletproofs, it's already better. Um, the really, the big question is for more complicated statements. So people have proposed producing a snark for saying, you know, the entire history, I, I just give you the UTXO set, I can like, I can do this. I can give you the UTXO set plus a 188 byte that tells you this is the correct UTXO, uh, 188 byte proof that tells you this is the correct UTXO set. There would be no more syncing up. You just get the UTXO set, and uh, this extremely, it would be impossible to produce, but at least in theory, 
the, the proof would still be 188 bytes and take 10 milliseconds to verify. Uh, and I can give you a snark that says here, you know, this really, like, it, it, that basically processes and compresses the entire history of, of Bitcoin into a single 188 byte proof. It, not possible with both proofs uh, in terms of verification time. Not possible with snarks, but only be in terms of proving time. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, there is, yeah, sorry, I, I just, uh, I don't have to plug to the website. So the website is crypto.stanford.edu slash bulletproofs. There you can find the paper. I think at this point you might even be able to Google it. Um, and uh, we'll push an update to it on Friday. So if you're a little bit patient, you can read it then. Uh, and yeah, also more, yeah, there's more uh, links to code and whatever. A Java implementation will will soon link the C implementation and yeah. Thank you.